It is now my privilege to introduce the Harvard Medical School Class of 2012 commencement speaker, Dr. Donald Berwick. Dr. Berwick is the former president and CEO of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, an organization that Dr. Berwick co-founded and led for over 20 years. He is one of the nation's leading authorities on healthcare quality and improvement. In July 2010, President Obama appointed Dr. Berwick to the position of administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a position he held until December 2011. He is a pediatrician by training and has held positions at Harvard Medical School, the Harvard School of Public Health, and Boston Children's Hospital, among many others. He has also served in many roles, including the first independent member of the Board of Trustees of the American Hospital Association and chair of the National Advisory Council of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and also as a member of President Clinton's Advisory Commission on Consumer Protection and Quality in the Healthcare Industry. He is the recipient of awards too numerous to list, including the election to the Institute of Medicine and receipt of the William B. Graham Prize for Health Services Research. He is a prolific author of scientific articles and books, and in 2005, he was appointed Honorary Knight Commander of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth in recognition for his work with the British National Health Service. It is our great honor to have Dr. Berwick here with us today. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thank you all uh, very much, uh, Dean Donoff, Dean Flyer, faculty, uh, family and friends, and uh, most of all, uh, you wonderful students. Uh, a lot of uh, nice things have happened to me in my career and my professional work, but uh, I must tell you that uh, none has meant more to me than your very generous invitation to, sh to get to share some thoughts with you at this very important time. So thanks for letting me share it with you and your, your loved ones. You're amazing, you're wonderful, you ought to feel good, you ought to feel proud, you've earned it. Um, to get ready for today, I asked Dean Oriol to um, tell me what's on your minds. And she uh, asked you, uh, so, and then she told me. She said the word that she heard from you most when she polled some of you, many of you, was this word, worried. She said you're worried about the constant change around you, uncertain about the future of dentistry and uh, medicine, worried about whether you can make good living. Uh, you've boarded a boat, and you don't exactly know where the boat's going. Uh, let me first reassure you, uh, you've, made a, you've made a good choice. You made a spectacularly good choice. Just listen to your classmates in the introductory comments. The career that you have chosen is going to give you moments of poetry. Uh, my favorite moment is the, is the moment when the, the, the door closes, the click of the catch on the door that leaves you and the patient alone together in the, uh, in the, the privacy, the sanctity of the healing relationship. Uh, doors are going to open up also. Uh, you, I guarantee, are going to find ways to contribute that you just can't possibly anticipate right now. It's very exciting. Any more than I could have uh, dreamed of standing here uh, when I was sitting where you are 40 years ago. But look, I won't lie. Uh, I'm worried, too. I went to Washington uh, to lead CMS two years ago. I was full of hope for our country's long uh, overdue journey toward making health care a human right at last here. In lots of ways, I wasn't at all disappointed. I loved it. I, 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 saw, uh, I saw what good government could do. I saw the grandeur of democracy in its grand. And both are alive, even though they're not at the moment entirely well. But like you, I also found a lot that I could not control, uh, a context that is currently torn by antagonisms. Too many people in leadership, uh, people from whom we ought to be able to expect more, are willing to bend the truth, and they're willing to invent facts for their own convenience. I heard irresponsible, cruel, baseless, 
rhetoric about death panels silence a mature, compassionate, scientific inquiry into the care that we all need and that we all want in the last stages of our lives. I heard a meaningless, cynical accusations about rationing repeated over and over and over again in Washington by the same people who then unsheathed their knives to cut uh, Medicaid in the safety net. I watched fear grow on both sides of the political aisle, fear of authentic questions, fear of civil reason debate, fear of uh, tomorrow morning's headlines, a fear that stifled the respectful, uh, civil, shared inquiry upon which the health of democracy depends. And so the class of uh, HSDM and HMS, class of 2012, I'm worried too. I also am wondering where this boat's going. But I'm going to tell you there's a way to get our bearings. When you're in a fog, you need a compass. And I have a compass, and you have a compass too. We got that compass the day we decided to be uh, healers. Our compass is a question. It points true north, and that question is, how will it help the patient? Now, I'm going to give this patient a name this afternoon. Uh, the name is Isaiah. He once lived. Uh, he was my patient, and um, I'm, uh, I'm dedicating this lecture to him. You are going to learn, if you haven't already, a very lovely lesson about uh, doctoring and dentistry. I guarantee it. You're going to learn that in a professional uh, life that's going to fly by very fast, very hard, a hectic life in which thousands and thousands of people are going to honor you by bringing to you, their pain and their confusion, a few of these people are going to stand out for reasons that you, you won't control and you may never understand. A few of these people are going to hug your heart. They're going to become, for you, touch points. They'll be, they'll be um, signposts, like that big boulder on your favorite trail that uh, when, you, when you spot it, it tells you exactly where you are. If you allow that, and you should allow that, then these people are going to enter your soul, and you will, in a, in a way that's entirely right, entirely proper, uh, you will love them. These people will become your teachers. So Isaiah taught me, and now I want him to teach you. He was uh, 15 years old when I met him. Uh, it was 1984. I was the officer of the day, the doctor on duty in my pediatric practice, which was at the old Harvard Community Health Plan. The, my nurse practitioner, Madeline, she pointed to an exam room and she said to me, you better get in there, that kid is in pain. And he was in pain. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah was a very tough looking inner city kid. Uh, I would have crossed the street to avoid Isaiah uh, meeting him alone on a Roxbury street corner at night. I'm not proud of that, but I admit it. But here on my exam table, this 15-year-old kid was writhing. He was sweating in pain. He was yelling obscenities at the air. And when I tried to examine him, he yelled them at me. I remember saying, don't you effing touch me. Do something. I didn't figure out what was going on that afternoon. Nothing made sense. Eventually, I diagnosed illogically uh, a back sprain, and I sent him home on uh, analgesics. And then that evening, the report came, an urgent call to me at my house from the lab. Isaiah did not have a back sprain. He had acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and we did not have his phone number. Uh, the police helped track him down that night uh, to a, a lonely three-decker, uh, third floor, solitary house in a weedy lot on Stafford Street in the heart of Roxbury. Isaiah lived there with his mother and his brothers and his mother's foster children. What followed that night was wonderful. It was the best of care. It was the glory of biomedical science. It all came to Isaiah's service. Uh, chemotherapy started, and he went predictably into, um, into remission. But we knew that acute lymphoblastic leukemia in a black uh, teenager behaves very badly. Unlike in a, in a younger white kid, a cure was unlikely. 
Uh, we knew he would go in, into remission for a while, but we also knew the cancer would come back and it would kill him. And indeed, three years later, Isaiah relapsed. So I drove to his apartment one night in uh, 1987, and I sat with Isaiah and his uh, graceful, dignified mother over a plastic a red checkered tablecloth, and I explained the only option we knew for possible cure. It was a bone marrow transplant, not when he felt sick, but now at the first sign of relapse when he was, he was uh, still feeling fine. He was feeling fine, and I was there to propose a treatment that could kill him. Well, they didn't hesitate. Isaiah wanted to live, and he got his bone marrow transplant from his brother. His course was very stormy, uh, admission after admission in the next year, year and a half, and then chronic complications of the transplant. He developed diabetes and severe asthma. Uh, his children's hospital medical record that year, I uh, collected once. It took up five four-inch thick volumes. But he got through it. Isaiah, Isaiah was cured. We got uh, very close, Isaiah and, and, and me, through this time. And for years after, uh, long conversations about his life, his hopes, his worries. He always asked me about my kids. Um, and his mother, close, uh, also. She was an angel. She was a tough angel raised by her sharecropper grandfather in a North Carolina farm. And she read Isaiah the Riot Act when she had to, and she fiercely protected him. And during the darkest times of Isaiah's course, she continued to tend for her 10 foster children as well as her own. I did come to know Isaiah well, I guess, but it wouldn't be uh, correct to call us uh, friends. Our worlds were too far apart. We we're in different galaxies, actually. But my respect, my affection for Isaiah grew and grew through the years, his courage, his insight, his generosity. But there is more to the story. Isaiah smoked his first dope at age five. He owned his first gun at age nine. And by 12, he committed his first armed robbery. He was on crack at 14. Even on chemotherapy, he was in and out of police custody. For months after his transplant, he tricked me into extra prescriptions of uh, narcotics, which he hoarded, and I suspect he sold them. Uh, two of his five brothers were in jail, one for murder. Uh, two years into Isaiah's treatment, a third brother, Jeffrey, was shot dead uh, by a gun blast through the front door in a, in a drug dispute. Isaiah didn't finish school. He had no idea what to do for legitimate work. He got and he lost job after job for not showing up or for being careless. His world was the street corner, and his horizon was one day away. He saw no way out. He hated it, but he saw no way out. He once told me that he thought his leukemia was a blessing, because at least while he was in the hospital, he couldn't be on the streets. And Isaiah died. Uh, one night, uh, 18 years later, 18 years, 18 years and one month after his leukemia was cured, 37 years old, they found him on a street corner, breathing, but brain dead, from a prolonged convulsion, from uncontrolled diabetes, and even more uncontrolled despair. Isaiah tried to call me the night of his fatal seizure. He had my home number, uh, and I still have this slip of paper. I, I found it the other day on which my daughter wrote the message, Isaiah called, please call him back. I never did. He would have said, hi, Dr. Berwick, it's Isaiah. Uh, I'm really sick, I can't take it. Please help me, I don't know what to do. That's what he often said to me. Isaiah spent the last two years of his life in a vegetative state in a nursing home where I sometimes visited him and his family. At his funeral, his family asked me to speak, and I, I could only think to talk about his courage. Isaiah was my patient, uh, cured of leukemia, uh, killed by hopelessness. I bring Isaiah today to you as my witness to two duties. You have both duties, and this is where your compass points. First, you will cure his leukemia. You will bring the benefits of biomedical science to him, no less than to anyone else. Isaiah's poverty, his race, 
his troubled lifeline. Not one of these facts, nor any other fact, will stand in the way of his right to care, his human right to care. Let the Supreme Court have its day. Let the erratics and the vicissitudes of, of uh, politics play out their careless game. No matter, health care is a human right. It must be made so in our country, and it is your duty to make it so. Therefore, for your patience, you will go to the mat. You will not lose your way. You are a physician, you are a dentist, and you have a compass. Your compass points true north to what the patient needs, and you will put the patient first. But that is not enough. Isaiah's life and his death, they testify to one further duty, one more subtle duty maybe, but it is not less important. I think maybe as I was writing this that this second duty may not be one you meant to embrace. You may not welcome it as you do individual healing. It is to cure not only the killer leukemia, it is to cure the killer injustice. And um, Antoine de saint exupéry from The Little Prince wrote, to become a man, I think he meant to become a man or a woman, is to be, is to be responsible. He said, it is to be ashamed of miseries that you did not cause. So I think this, I think to profess to be a healer, that is to take the oath you will take today, is to be responsible. It is to be ashamed of miseries that you did not cause. That is a heavy burden. As I said, I did not think you asked for it. But please look at the facts. In our nation, in our great wealthy nation, the wages of poverty are enormous. The proportion of our people who are living below the official poverty line has grown from its low point in 1973, 11%, to over 15% today. Among children, it is 22%. 16.4 million Americans. Among black Americans, it's 27%. In 2010, over 46 million Americans are living in poverty. And 20 million, 20 million are living in extreme poverty, incomes below $11,000 a year for a family of four. A million American children are homeless. More people are poor in America today than in any other time in our nation's history. 1.5 a million American households with 2.8 million children live on less than $2 a person per day in our country. And 50 million more Americans live between the poverty line and just 50% above it. They're the near poor. The Urban Institute says of them, for them, the loss of a job, a cut in uh, work hours, a serious health problem, or a rise in housing costs can quickly push them into greater debt, uh, bankruptcies, brink, or even homelessness. And for the undocumented immigrants in our borders, it is even worse. For all of these people, our nation's commitment to the social safety net, the portion of our policy and of our national investment that reaches help out to the disadvantaged is life's blood. Today, that net is fraying. It is fraying badly. In 2010, uh, while I was in office at CMS, 20 states eliminated option, optional Medicaid benefits or decreased coverage. State social services block grants and food stamps are under the gun. Read the paper. Enrollment in the TANF program, temporary assistance for needy families, a crucial program has lagged way beyond the need. Now, let me be clear, the will to eradicate poverty in America is wavering, it is in jeopardy. In the great uh, entrance hall to the Hubert Humphrey building, that's the headquarters uh, where CMS is, where I worked, headquarters of the Department of Health and Human Services, chiseled on the wall of the great hall in massive letters are the words of Senator Hubert Humphrey, uh, which he spoke at the dedication of that building in his name. He said, these are the words, the moral test of government 
is how it treats people in the dawn of life, the children, the twilight of life, the aged, and in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. I think this is the moral test of professions as well. These among us in the shadows, they don't speak, not loudly. They often don't vote. They don't contribute to political campaigns or PACs. They employ no lobbyists. They write no op-eds. We pass by their coin cups outstretched as if invisible on the corner as we head for Starbucks. And Congress passes them by too because they don't vote and campaigns cost money. And if those in power do not choose of their own free will to speak for them, the silence descends. This is what I learned in Washington. Isaiah was born into the shadows of life. Leukemia could not overtake him, but the shadows could, and they did. I am not blind to Isaiah's responsibilities, nor was he. He was embarrassed by his failures. He fought against his addictions, against his disorganization, his temptations. He tried, I know he tried. To say that the cards were stacked against him is too glib, because other people might have played those cards differently, played the hand better. I know that, he knew that. But to ignore Isaiah's condition, not of his choosing, the harvest of racism, the frailty of the safety net, the vulnerability of the poor is simply wrong. His survival depended, yes, on proper chemotherapy, but also equally on a compassionate society. I am not sure when the moral test that Senator Humphrey talked about was put on hold when it became negotiable, when our nation in its political discourse decided that it was uh, uncool to make its ethics explicit and its moral commitments clear to the people in the dawn, the twilight, and the shadows. But those commitments have never in my lifetime felt both so vulnerable and so important. You aren't confused, the world is. You need not forget your purpose, even if the world does. Leaders are not leaders who permit pragmatics to quench purpose. Your purpose is to heal. And what needs to be healed is more than Isaiah's bone marrow. It is our moral marrow. It is that of a nation founded on common humanity. My brother, Bob, is a retired school teacher, and he told me a few weeks ago that he always gets goosebumps when he reads the phrase, we the people. That's we, you and me and Isaiah, inclusive. I think it is time to recover and indeed to celebrate a moral vocabulary in our nation, one that speaks without apology or hesitation of the right to health care, the human right, and without apology or hesitation of the absolute unacceptability of the vestiges of racism, the violence of poverty, the blindness to the needs of the least powerful among us. Now, you will put on your white coats. And you are going to enter a career of privilege. Society gives you rights and licenses it gives to no one else. And in return for that, you promise to put the interests of those for whom you care ahead of your own interests. Uh, that promise and that obligation, I will tell you, give you voice in public discourse simply because of the oath you have sw sworn. Uh, use that voice. If you do not speak, I don't know who will. If, <clears throat> so, if Isaiah needs a bone marrow transplant, then you will, by the oath you swear, you will get it for him. But Isaiah needs more. He needs the compassion of a nation. He needs the generosity of a commonwealth. He needs justice. He, he's an, he needs a nation to recall that no matter what the polls say, and no matter what happens to be temporarily convenient 
at a time of political combat and economic stress that the moral test transcends convenience. Isaiah, in his legions, needs those in power. He needs you to say to others in power that a nation that fails to attend to the needs of those less fortunate among us risks its soul. That is your duty, too. This is my message from Isaiah's life and from his death. Be worried, but do not for one moment be confused. You are healers, everyone. You are healers ashamed of miseries you did not cause, and your voice, everyone, can be loud and forceful and confident, and your voice will be trusted. And in his honor, in Isaiah's honor, I ask you, please use it. Thank you.